some of the draft room videos that these guys were sending me while I was on vacation, I thought were extremely interesting. And I was going to cut them up, put them on here, didn't get around to it. The first one that I want to talk about is the Panthers making that trade with the Rams. Uh, the Rams came up and got uh, Braden uh, Fisk. And the Panthers moved back to 52. I think eventually moved up, got Jonathan Brooks at pick 46 or some, something like that. But they moved back to 52. And they got next year's second. And the like listening to the, the deals, like how excited they are in this situation where it's like the Panthers actually seem to be like making some good moves. Like... I, I look at it and I go like, so what's the what's the one thing that's not working out there? And it just seems to be the ownership. It was the guy before David Tepper. I forget who it was. Was it uh, Richardson? Richardson. Or, yeah. And now to Tepper, like they've been to two Super Bowls in this organization's history. Like they do things right. Like you're looking at it. Somebody calls them and says, hey, you only have to drop back like 13 positions and you're getting a second next year when you didn't have a second it's like uh how fast can i say yes to the to this deal which they do and and the the gm almost kind of like the look on his face is like um is this for like he the guy shows him the text message he's like is this for real like wait we get this year's 52 and a second next year like I, what, what did you guys think of this one for the Panthers? Like you guys, you guys would have done this move, right? Like there was nobody on the board that you were like, Hey, we got to have Chris Jenkins or like somebody who is still like Mikey Sanders still was still on the board. I believe uh, Adnoy Mitchell was still on the board, but they had already drafted yeah. Xavier Leggett at the, you guys would have made this move. Like, what'd you guys think of this video? Well, here, here's the thing, Tony, that we're, we're actually forgetting. Like this isn't like you were looking at just the Panthers and the Rams, right? And anybody in their right mind accepts this trade in a heartbeat before they change it. Like you're, I'm giving you uh, 39, number 39. You're going to be 52, 155, and a second round pick next year. Yes, I'm taking this deal. We're done with it. Uh, there's no, I don't care who's on the board left. We're we're taking this deal. And we're we're you're you're going to win that deal 100 percent of the time, no matter what. But the bigger picture is the Rams were shopping. That number, the, that fifty-second pick, to to basically everybody in the NFL, like every like, there's a lot of videos that have come out of the Rams going, "Hey, we want to move here, but we'll give you 52. Like if you go back and look at the first round, the videos of the Rams in the first round, where they're calling everybody in the top ten or or the Raiders or somebody trying to move up for Brock Bowers, they go, "We'll give you 19 and 52." Like 52 was the draft pick that they were willing to. If if they really wanted somebody else, why didn't they offer that second round pick and move up in the first round too? Like that's that's like I don't I'm not I'm trying to wrap my mind around that. If they really thought like if they make it seem like Brock Bowers was the guy that the Rams really wanted, that McVay really wanted, why didn't they throw that second round pick in earlier to move up? I bet you could have got the Jets to move back if you wanted to from ten to to nineteen, and then give me two second round picks, one next year, one this year. I bet the Jets would have took that deal. I, I bet you that if they would have sweetened it up, they would have had Brock Bowers on their team right now. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. I knew they were after Bowers. But, yeah, like Bowers in the McVay offense, whew, to kind of taking over the Cooper Cup role, sort of playing that, like, you know, re read the coverage, read the leverage, know, you know, know where he's he's got to be. Like, I think he would really thrive in that sort of offense. And now he's just in a wasteland. So. Sorry exactly. I was yeah. about to say I wanted that. I want that to rewind t time here. Go get in Joe Douglas's ear, like, bro, take the deal, take the deal, move back. You probably still would have gotten what you wanted back. Where were they at? Nineteen or twenty? They would have to move back like eight spots to get those to get the extra second round pick. Even before you throw in another second round pick, should have taken the damn deal. Should have done it. Well, they they offered drafted it. Brock Bowers. You kind of. I mean, it was fun to see Joe like confused and mad and stuff, but I didn't want to see one. Brock Bowers go to the Raiders. I would have rather gotten Joe happy with whoever and Brock Bowers not be a Raider for sure. Well, it, it, they offered it. You see the, the video of Joe Douglas turning it down. Like they really wanted their offensive lineman or whatever it was, but 
I mean, with all the shit that's going on with the Jets right now, I think that trade would have benefited them as right now. There, there's well, more the to go. Right We're not gonna... Aaron Rodgers not showing up to minicamp. They made a trade for his, for Reddick, who told them, I'll be there. Then he realized, oh, the other defensive linemen are there, not there. Uh, you got rid of Huff and all them. Now I have the leverage, and I'm not going to show up. The Jets have drama right now. They could have made them, that move and been good. Aaron Rodgers missed one day of practice. Two days, I think. Yeah, Total. I mean, they're your Jets, Mike. And they're your Jets. Hassan, it's fine. Hassan yeah. Reddick is just in a contract negotiation, like any yeah. edge rusher in a contract negotiation and not no. practicing. I think oh, yeah. I think history will show us having a bunch of new offensive linemen trying to figure it out on the fly to protect a 40-year-old quarterback. Those type of things, they tend to work out really good for the team and the organization. So well, I am say I am I am also on top of it. I'm kind of on both sides of the fence here. Should have <laughs> should have done the trade back, should have made it happen. Yes, maximize the picks or just stay there and draft Brock, Brock Bowers. What was wrong with that in New York? You guys couldn't have done that. That would have been helpful. Absolutely not. I am totally against that. Fashanu, an offensive <laughs> lineman, is what the Jets needed. They did not need Brock Bowers. They need to get the offensive line right. And I think Fashanu. As, as much as I'm rooting for the Jets to just make you guys look completely stupid, yeah, I honestly don't care about him that much. I don't want Brock Bowers to be with the Raiders at all. Please no. <laughs> That's the thing is, I don't want anybody to be on the Raiders or the Chiefs. So the issue is, like, I yeah. kind of got to pick my poison. As long as they didn't take any of the good Michigan players or like my favorite wide receivers, then I was, I was okay. It's like the like, Bills I, fans. That, the Bills fans were freaking out with me. Like, come on, man, we weren't going to draft Xavier Worthy. That was a great deal. I was like, there is no good deal in dealing with yeah, those bro. motherfuckers. There is no good deal. You'd never win the deal when you're dealing with the Chiefs. So the one thing you got out of all the draft videos that we watch, right? And I, I love it. This is what, as an NFL fan growing up, I've always wanted to be a fly on the wall. Well, I'm a big ass fly on the wall yeah, so in the draft thing. room, like right in the war room. Like that's, I think that's any any NFL fan. Like you want to know what's going on inside the war room. You want to see, like, because they yeah, always put out that bullshit. Like Mike was our number one pick the whole time. We were looking at it and we were like, we're ten pick. We got the tenth pick and we want Mike. Bullshit. You know there was three people ahead of him that they were like, yeah. "Fuck, we missed out on him. We missed out on Tony. Like, we want this guy." Uh, like, I would, I mean, I would love to see their rankings and how they actually rank people. That would be the one thing. So these little videos that come out of the war room of what's going on, it's awesome. But the one thing you're learning, and so I think one of the general managers said, it's hard. Teams are not willing to trade back as much. Like, they don't want to be that one that made a mistake. Like. I traded back and missed out on this generational talent and he went above me. So you're looking at it both different, you know, uh, different ways. Like this guy's trying to move up. Why is he trying to move up? I'm going to, I want that player. If he's, if everybody's trying to fight for that guy, I don't want to be the guy, the general manager that screwed up on that. Yes. Which uh, leads us into a great spot to talk about the video of Ryan Poles calling the Falcons. So the Falcons have so much sunk into Michael Penix. Cause when I saw this, I was like, wait, a team that is asking you if you want to go back one pick and they're going to give you a fourth round pick like that. And your team can use picks, can use players, can use more of, uh, you know, shots, <laughs> lottery tickets. And you're telling me you thought maybe that the bears were going to get there and draft a second QB. They already drafted Caleb Williams at one, so you could go back one spot. They're moving up to get their player. Unless you think Ryan Poles is such an evil genius that he was going to trade up one spot and then trade a bigger package with another team to come up and steal Penix Jr. from you. Like, actually... I can't believe <laughs> that they stayed and took Michael Penix in that spot when they had an opportunity to go back one and get another draft pick out of it. Like, and you all, cause you already gave Kirk cousins all this money. So worst case scenario is they take Michael Penix and then you just draft the best D lineman or the best cornerback or the best, any defensive player was on the board. Latu Turner, like you could have went any direction. <laughs> like I just couldn't, I was watching that video and Ryan Poles is like, yeah, so uh, we did something similar with Philly last year. No, you're not interested. Uh, okay. And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, Atlanta, make the deal. Make, even though I already knew the end of the movie, I was already like, no, Atlanta, make the deal, make the deal. It just makes the Falcons draft date even dumber, right? Like when you saw that one, I was like, 
Are you freaking kidding me? Like, like you said, it's you got a free fourth round pick. He drops now, and you save just a little bit of money because each slot has you know uh, what they're worth. You, you could have probably saved one or two million dollars by dropping down a little bit. <laughs> it's like, and you still get the same guy that you wanted. And Tony, not even that. Not only did they draft Michael Penix when they gave a lot of money to Kirk Cousins, right? They gave up the fourth round pick or they gave up getting the chance of getting the fourth round pick by moving one. They also got hit by the NFL for uh, talking to Kirk Cousins and other players. for, And, that, and so they lost the fifth round pick. <laughs> oh my God. Like the Atlanta Falcons front office, like, I don't know. It's just, it's hilarious of what's going on in there. They need Michael Penix, that pick, to hit so bad, or it's going to be one of those things where there's going to be a like a documentary, an hour long documentary <laughs> made on the fumble that they did. Because not only that, they passed on Bill Belichick. If Belichick comes back and coaches a team next year and he's dominant, so like everything, the Falcons are going to be under such a microscope of how this offseason is gone. And I root for the Falcons. You guys know this. And I'm, I'm a big fan of Michael Penix. Like, I think that that's a good pick. I don't, I wouldn't have fully gone this route about it, but I think it's a really good pick. I like Michael Penix. I just, Mike, go ahead. Now you guys summed it all up. The Falcons are playing with fire and lighting themselves on fucking fire pretty much at this point. But the funny thing is, Tony, is that if the Bears would have done what the Falcons are worried about them doing, then that would have saved the Falcons from looking like the idiots of the draft. And the Bears have been the idiots of the drafts with two quarterbacks inside the top, top ten. Yeah, they would have, <laughs> they would have been idiots. You would have saved yourself some pain and misery there. And like you were, like you guys were saying, every defensive player on the board, and that probably was the smarter way to go, anyways. So you might have accidentally stumbled yourself into a better situation. So, and the craziest uh, part about it all, the craziest part about it all, is I am super high on the Falcons. Like I think this is one of the the, the young most talented teams, especially offensively in the league. And now you get a veteran quarterback in there. I think B. John Robinson is going to be absolutely phenomenal this year, but how good, how much better could they be if they were just using these types of situations to get just a little bit better? That extra player helps you to get just a little bit better. And that first round pick they used on a backup quarterback could may help you get a lot better, but at minimum yeah. you get the fourth round pick. Maybe that guy could help your defense just a little bit. Yeah, you put Latu on the you put Latu on the Atlanta Falcons right now. Yeah, I think they have the division locked up. Yeah, so I think that's kind of where I'm at. The Penix pick m made me lean a little. I was kind of Bucks Falcons back and forth mm -hmm. as I'm like going through, and I, I start to put together preliminary for our division ranking show later in the summer, and I I've kind of floated back and forth. And that the more I look at it, it's like you could have gotten a real like difference maker potentially like in that top at that, at that pick at number eight. And you didn't, you got a guy that is maybe the best backup QB in the league, but if things go according to plan, he won't see the field. And you could have had a guy that could have, you know, had 45 pressures and, eight and a half sacks or something like that. And that's, yeah. that's get someone to line up outside, man. AJ Terrell fell off a cliff. He probably would be a better slot corner with his build. Anyways, get someone you can put outside. So that way AJ can move in. And then people forget they have Jesse Bates over the top. Like they could have formed a decent secondary with just one pick. I agree. It, like AJ Terrell, I think is going to play really well. And the way, Raheem Morris plays defense. I think AJ Terrell is going to have a nice bounce back season. So if you get him and then you go get Quinion Mitchell, right. Or maybe you like Terry and Arnold. I don't know. You get one of those guys, you know, Nate Wiggins. It, it just, it's different. Anyways, the last video that they sent that I wanted to talk about briefly, and this is more just like, it was really long, but Adam Peters, calls Howie Roseman a pain in the ass, right? And that's one of those things where that is the nicest way of describing his true feelings about him because he knows there's like 15 cameras on him. Like there's probably one that's like currently like the NFL is like, yeah, we're we're biopsying that, you know, or we're like monitoring their insides too. Like they have so many cameras on these guys. Like we're getting complete coverage of them. And he's like, well, you know, he's like, oh, you're such a pain in the ass. I'm sure when those cameras were off and they were in a room where, you know, 
Washington had all the you know, no more filming for commanders.com or whatever. He's like, bleep, 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 bleep. Howie Roseman's a, <laughs> you know, like the things that these guys would say, because we all know what it is when the cameras shut off. It's like, we are, we're willing to say things a little bit, you know, more honestly, aggressively, more vulgar or whatever. Like that's, I mean, I don't know about Joe, but I am definitely that way. Like, like I would, I just heard it and I was like, I want to know Adam Peters real feelings on dealing with him because calling somebody a pain in the ass is the nicest way of saying like, I hate you. Like, I can't believe that you're somebody that I have to deal with because he's like, he's trying to, and the deal is like, great. Like, I thought the deal was like beneficial to both sides and how he's like, Oh, actually, I need this from you, too. And it's like, no, why are you being so damn greedy? Like, I have two minutes left on the clock. He's like, we'll make this pick. And then Howie calls him back and is like, yeah, you know what? We'll take the uh, that original deal that we got. If I understood the video properly. Yeah, yeah. No, that's right. But, like, that's how I understood it. Howie gives him, makes him sweat it out all the way to, like, 90 seconds left on the clock. And calls him back and goes, yeah, you know what? It's a good deal. We'll take it. Like, <laughs> but it's see, funny because that's we the way that division rivals should be te- treating each other, Tony. He's a I division agree. rival. Get a little bit more. But I would have really wanted to hear what Adam Peters had to say. Mike, go ahead. Like I was just gonna say that, that it's a ton of fun to see this kind of stuff, especially with these two going at it. Division rivals, they're real close to each other. They they gotta go at it. And by the way, Adam Peters, if you intend on being the long term GM of the Washington Commanders, I don't think Howie Roseman's going anywhere. So just have fun with that for maybe a decade to come. But it's a lot of fun to see this stuff kind of unfold because this is how I negotiate my trades for fantasy football. So this is probably how I would do it if I was the GM too. I'm constantly going around getting, you know, offers to leverage against other offers, get deals to offer against this, wait until the last minute to do deals. Literally, I think me and Tony have done trades seconds before drafts have started in the past. Like this is the fun of it. This is probably what's really fun about being a GM is how is how you can kind of play the game as you will. Uh, not to I'm a, Triple I'm H. a little more less sneed where it's like I will overpay for something that I want. Yeah. Like, like I don't care. CD Lamb for Herbert. We still got to do that. Yeah. CD. Well, you're getting CD. You're either getting CD and Anthony Richardson or CD and a running back. One of the two. Like it's it's your choice. But I think I'll probably take Richardson. Oh,